I want to talk today about the urgency of humanism, and I want to put humanism also in context with its history, because I think a lot of people forget or just aren't aware of the long and rich tradition that is secular humanism. I want to talk a bit about my own story today, and I really want to emphasize where the humanist organizations of the world, the most effective ones and the most prominent ones are, and what they're, what they're up to. It's definitely a time of uncertainty with old political threats being made new again, open bigotry and violence are on display across the world. And so humanism with our values of reason, compassion, democracy, and peace are more urgent and valuable than ever. But we do need to understand what we're talking about. Of course, humanism is a giant topic, something that philosophers and academics have spent books and books and treaties on. So I'm not going to pretend to cover all of that. The history of humanism goes back millennia, but I'm going to focus mostly on the modern era. So before we delve into my story, I want to give, don't worry too much about what's on the slides. I will read everything for you. I was going to read it off here, but I put Linux on my laptop and now it's all weird and that's my own fault. So the American Humanist Association has this definition of, humanist, of humanism. It's a progressive philosophy of life that without theism and other supernatural beliefs, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. And that's how concise they can get it. British humanists, being British, are a bit wordier. Humanism is an approach to life based on humanity and reason. Humanists recognize moral values are properly found on human nature and experience alone, and that the aims of morality should be human welfare, happiness, and fulfillment. Our decisions are based on the available evidence and our assessment of the outcomes of our actions, not any dogma or sacred text. This is James Croft. He's much more eloquent, I think. Not, no offense to the people of the British Human Association or American Human Association, but he once described humanism as these sim three simple words, reason, compassion, and hope. I like when taglines can get distilled. It shows a real understanding of an issue when he talks about reason, he's talking about science, he's talking about evidence, he's talking about logic and those things that we value a lot here. When he talks about compassion, he's talking about equality, fighting for the underdogs, promoting justice, and trying to just care about other humans no matter what their background is. And hope isn't this blind faith, optimistic, let's just all pretend. It's the idea of progress and the idea of progressive values and that using these first two things will change the world. So humanism is always looking forward at how can we make the world a better place and the ideas using humanity's reasons. But I want to talk about myself because I have a stage and I'm going to let you look at baby me because my mother likes to post baby photos of me on Facebook. So this is baby me. I grew up in rural southern Alberta, just outside of Calgary. Despite that, it was still a pretty much non-religious household. My family weren't atheist, but we didn't go to church even on Christmas or Easter. We were essentially secular, a-religious. Um, I came across religion mostly through the media or through my friends, some of whom went to United Church or other kinds of churches. I remember one friend who, after his mother passed away, stopped coming to school to be homeschooled, but I'm pretty sure he was also very evangelical or his family was. And so there was that connection. I knew some Mormon friends. Southern Alberta was very white, very Christian, but it was increasingly non-religious. When I was little, I had a keen interest in science. Always my family was very, I was very privileged to have a family that encouraged that. And I always liked playing around with computers. As I said, I put Linux on my laptop, which is not a normal thing to do. Normal. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I also got into punk rock as a kid a kind of music that really caught my rebellious teenage years, but the lyrics of punk rock are all about fighting authority and challenging dogma and really fighting for the underdog and standing up for equality. Some of it's very anarchist, which is its own realm, but one thing that inspired me, and I learned much later that Greg Graffin, the founder of Bad Religion, one of the biggest punk rock bands of all time, is a secular humanist. He's also a biology professor, I think, at UC Berkeley. That's just cool. <laughs> and so I saw bands like that at Warp Tour, and I saw that sort of culture growing up. I also grew up with a brother with a disability. My younger brother, Tyler, has cerebral palsy, and so he uses a wheelchair. And so I was always aware of 
accessibility issues and the need to make sure that he could go places because he wasn't less than anyone else. He was smart and talkative, but he just needed to use a wheelchair. And so if he couldn't get into a movie theater, that was unfair and we needed to fight that. And my mother was very strong at fighting for that. So if you've seen the new TV show Speechless, my mother is sort of like that mother. That sh I mean, that show was written by someone whose brother has CP, and so he's got a very similar experience to me. It's a, it's a comedy about a kid with cerebral palsy. It's pretty funny. Uh, in 2004, pursuing my interest in science, I went to the University of Alberta to do engineering. I didn't really know what I wanted to do at school, and engineering sounded like the least boring thing. And that's sort of been my progression through life a lot, actually. When I, because I took my first year in general studies in engineering, and then I looked, I had to specialize in the second year. And I looked at all the options, chemical, mechanical, civil, electrical, all these things. I looked, and they're all kind of boring. Like bridges are cool, but I want to discover new things. So I went into engineering physics, which was the hardest and most obscure. And the joke was always there, engineers don't get jobs, they go to grad school. And I went to grad school, but I'll get to that. <laughs> While I was at the University of Alberta, I was heavily involved in campus life. It was around 2006, 2007 that I started reading atheist blogs and some of the Richard Dawkins books and some of those things. And I got involved in the Edmonton Atheist Meetup group because I was like, well, what's going on in the summer? And I started hanging out at that group. And I met a number of other students there. And I said, or we got together and said, why don't we have a group for us on campus? There's University of Alberta prides itself on having, I think, more student groups than any other university, and so there were more religious groups probably than any other university. And being in Alberta, you had all flavors of evangelical Christians, you had Catholics, you had Muslims, Jewish groups, and you'd walk through clubs fair and be like, why are there so many religious groups when we know that at least a third of millennials, and probably much more, are not religious? And so we started the University of, Al the university of Alberta Atheists and Agnostics not really knowing what to call it. And so we had that sort of compromised name. But our goal was to create a welcoming, or you could even call it a safe space for atheists, a place where we could get together and really encourage people to question religion and question the dogma. University is a great time to sort of question the things you're brought up with. And at the U of A, there was a lot of kids who came from rural Alberta, rural Saskatchewan, where their family was religious, and they were first starting to question those things. And we were a forum for that, and it was fantastic. We held um, social events like just what we called liquid rationalism that were pub days at the campus pub, sort of like skeptics in the pub is now. Uh, we held debates with the Christian club because they loved having a foil. It made, it brought more people out to those. And we held a lot of lectures or showed videos of nature documentaries and those kind of things. In 2009, I moved to Vancouver after having visited here once on a conference and just falling in love with the city. I really wanted to come here especially because I was kind of getting tired with the politics in Alberta. It was very libertarian, very right wing, and I didn't feel as at home there. I guess it's shifted a little now, but I really loved Vancouver, the weather, the beauty of the city. I know it rains a lot here, but when you stand outside in Edmonton at minus 40 waiting for a bus in a blizzard, rain doesn't matter. <laughs> So I came to Vancouver, I got accepted to SFU to do my graduate studies in physics, like I said. I, had, I ended up switching professors, but I did get my master's in physics there, playing with lasers, and that's a different topic that I think I have a talk online from a Cafe Scion. While I was at SFU, I got involved in the SFU Skeptics, which was basically like the U of A Atheist and Agnostics. It was a campus group for secular, non-religious, questioning, science-based humanists. And the SFU skeptics said they included humanism. And I started coming to these meetings here because I was looking for community. And as I sort of got more involved in the events here, I ran for the board. I got elected to the board because if you show up, you can get elected to the board, as we all know. I became secretary and then president. And then we saw the expansion and we saw growth in this. And we decided that was the time where we could hire our first executive director, and I applied for that and was honored to be the first executive director of this organization, one of the few people paid to be an atheist in the country. I can count them on one hand or less. 
maybe one finger. And throughout this time, from when I started reading about the new atheism until even today, I've been learning more and more about humanism and the history of this movement, of this idea, and really putting it in context of how those values I talked about growing up, I didn't just throw those stories in there for fun. They match my values, those ideas of promoting equality, of science, of reason, of just making a better world. Environmentalism and social justice, this is what humanism is. So that's why I'm not a philosopher of humanism, I'm not an expert on it. I like to think I can speak to it being a staffer of a humanist organization who's been involved in a while. But that's my story, and so let's get into a bit more of the history, and rather than go all the way back to talk about the ancient Greeks and the Confucian philosophies and all of the sort of pro-human atheist theologies, if that's, that's not the right word, the pro-human atheist worldviews of history, of which there are a lot, I'm going to essentially start at the end of the 19th century. And I think the first way to really get a sense of what humanism is, is to look at what happens when a whole bunch of humanist academics get together and write a manifesto. Because you gotta be pretty self-centered self to write a manifesto, but it means you've come together and agreed on something and agreed on a definition. And it really gives us a sense of where humanist, humanism came from its sort of 19th century beginnings when it started to identify with that label. So the first Humanist Manifesto was written in 1933. It was essentially about religious humanism, and they used the words a little bit different. Uh, religious humanism just means humanists who like to do religious things but are still atheists. So they get together and have groups and like the idea of community. It doesn't mean they believe in a god. The first Humanist Manifesto here was, this is like 10 point font, so it's two pages. They were wordy back in those days, but things you can see from 1933, they talk about religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. They didn't believe in a deity that created the world. They talked about, they find that traditional dualism of the mind and body must be rejected. In 1933, they just threw out dualism. They just went, nope, it's just natural. They talked about evolution. They say modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. Ethics is a human pursuit, and that's one of the cores of humanism. They talked about rejecting ideas, uh, or the time has passed for theism, deism, modernism, and several varieties of new thought, some of which you can still see in Vancouver. They move on to talk a bit more about ethics, and I'll and a lot of this is repeated. None of this essentially, even though they release new manifestos and newer words, it doesn't really reject the old. My favorite one in here is the 14th of 15 sort of affirmations. And I'll read it in full because it's enlightening. The humanists are firmly committed that existing acquisitive and profit motives motivated society has shown itself to be inadequate and that a radical change in methods, controls, and motives must be instituted. A socialized and cooperative economic order must be established to the end that the equitable distribution of the means of life be possible. The goal of humanism is a free and universal society in which people voluntarily and intelligently cooperate for the common good. Humanists demand a shared life in a shared world. It's like borderline Marx there. It's almost talking about seizing the means of production. They did walk that back. That was one of the ones they walked back a bit, but it showed that Humanism was always almost a left-wing philosophy. It was on this idea of we need to look out for each other and we, need a and we need a society that looks out for each other. 40 years later, the Humanist Manifesto, as I should have said, also all come from the American Humanist Association. There's no documents out there that say those are wrong. There are other documents like the Amsterdam Declaration, which was written first in 1953 and then updated in 2003 by the International Humanist Ethical Union. The 2003 version is what we've adopted, but it's all part of the same tradition and the same line of thought. The second Humanist Manifesto was written by someone named Paul Kurtz and others. Paul Kurtz, if you've heard of him, he founded the Center for Inquiry after he split with the American Humanist Association, but he was always a big thinker, always a philosopher. He really championed skepticism, science, compassion, 
He was also a very verbose person, which is why the second manifesto in the same point font is five pages now. And I won't read it all, but I do like some of the words in here, like the views that merely reject theism are not equivalent to humanism. They lack a commitment to the positive belief in the possibilities of human progress and the values central to it, which is a fancy way of saying humanism is more than atheism. It is an atheist philosophy, as we saw in the first manifesto, but it's more than that. It talks about values. So the first section of this multi-page document talks about religion and its rejection of it and the rejection of traditional claims. Specifically, traditional religions are surely not the only obstacle to human progress, though. Other ideologies also impede human advance. Some forms of political doctrine, for instance, function religiously, reflecting the worst features of orthodoxy and authoritarianism, especially when they sacrifice individuals on the altar of utopian promises. You have to remember, between 1933 and 1973, a few things happened in the world where we learned that ideology can be dangerous. So we are rejecting the, the Nazi movement, the fascists. We're also rejecting the utopian prete pretenses of the Soviet Union at this point. Purely economic and political viewpoints, whether capitalist or communist, often function as religious and ideological dogma. Although humans undoubtedly need economic and political goals, they also need creative values by which to live. And so it moves into ethics, where it talks about, again, deriving human ethics from human experience and not from orthodoxy, but it also, and from reason. But it also says reason must, or reason should be balanced with compassion and empathy and the whole person fulfilled. It talks about the maximum individual autonomy consonant with social responsibility, and that phrase or variation of it is in almost all of the recent humanist manifestos. Individual liberty and social responsibility. We are not libertarians. The sixth one here is where, in the individual section, is where this document, the second humanist manifesto, really starts to get into issues. It talks about, in areas of sexuality, we believe in tolerant attitudes, often cultivated by orthodox religions and puritanical cultures, unduly repress sexual conduct. It advocates for the right to birth control, abortion, and divorce. And it talks about basically anything that's consensual is good and humanists support it. If two adults loving do something consensual and it doesn't harm anyone else, let them be. Let's get rid of anti-gay laws. Let's get, a get rid of anti-trans laws. Let's get rid of sodomy laws. It goes on to talk about a civilized society being a tolerant one that rejects the considering sexuality evil. It does talk about, um, moral education also being very important. It goes into democracy and democracy becomes a much bigger value here. And the first thing it says about democracy is that we must experience a full range of civil liberties in all societies. By this, it means sort of what's in the charter of rights and freedoms, what's in the universal declaration of humanness, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a humanist document as much as they come. This, in 1973, I remind you, talks about the recognition for an individual's right to die with dignity, euthanasia, and the right to suicide. In 1973, we were on the assisted dying side. And we've only just won that in Canada. It talks about participatory, participatory democracy in all aspects of life, the family, the workplace, really leveling the playing field to make sure everyone's voice is heard. It's about standing up for the underdog again. It walks, like I said, it walks back the overthrow the means of production, or seize the means of production language a little bit, but it still says humane society should evaluate economic systems not by rhetoric or ideology, but by whether or not they increase economic well-being for all individuals and groups, minimize poverty and hardship, increase the sum of human satisfaction, and enhance the quality of life. Hence, the door is open to alternative economic systems. We need, to we need to democratize the economy and judge it by its responsiveness to human needs, testing results in terms of the common good. So GDP is not the measure humanists use to evaluate a country. That's not to say we still stand by the, like, we need a communist overthrow. It generally supports, a, in my view, a more equitable distribution. It talks about, in the 11th principle, elimination of all discrimination based on race, religion, sex, age, or national origin. And wherever pos and it then goes on to say, wherever, pos wherever resources make possible, a minimum guaranteed annual income should be brought in. In 1973, it wanted a basic income. 
So when we had Nick Taylor speak here a couple weeks ago about it, it's part of our long tradition of supporting that cause. Uh, we are concerned for the welfare of the aged, the infirm, the disadvantaged, and also for the outcasts. And here the language reflects the times the mentally retarded, abandoned, or abused children, the handicapped prisoners or addicts. All of who, all, for all who are neglected or ignored by society. Again, folks looking out for the underdogs and the marginalized groups. It goes on to say we, again, in all of these, they also talk up universal education. We deplore racial, religious, ethnic, or class antagonisms. Although we believe in cultural diversity and encourage racial and ethnic pride, we reject separations which promote alienations and set groups of people against each other. We envision an integrated community where people have maximum opportunity for free and voluntary association. In my view, that's what multiculturalism is at its best, where people can be proud to be black, can be proud to be African, they can be proud to be Russian, but they still come together in the community and share common values. We are also critical of sexism or sexual chauvinism, both male and female, and we, be and we believe in equal rights for both women and men to fulfill their unique careers and potentials as they see fit, free from invidious discrimination, which is a nice word. It's in the world community section that the 1973 one starts to get into the New World Order territory. It talks about moving toward a world community in which all sectors of, humanity, of the human family can fully participate, but then it says, thus we look to, develop, look to the development of a system of a world law and world order based upon transnational federal government. It wanted a much stronger UN. And you have to remember at this time it was the height of the Cold, Cold War. It saw nationalistic divisions threatening the world. And, human, and the humanist response was to say, let's get together and talk. Let's have a stronger transnational democracy. Not like the League of Nations, maybe even stronger than the UN, maybe even the, something like the European Union, but on a global scale, where countries have a voice and people, the citizens have a voice in the way the world is governed as a way to prevent, as a way to prevent global war and as a way to promote peace, because peace is always in here. It explicitly says in the next section, war is obsolete, so is the use of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. We don't advocate for nuking our enemies, we advocate for talking with them. And then it goes on to talk about the world community engaging in cooperative planning concerning the use of rapidly depleting resources, looking at the world as a single ecosystem, environmentalism starts to come in, still looking at global politics from a lookout for the world poor. It talks about trying to eliminate world poverty. And finally, in the 17th paragraph, it talks about travel restrictions must cease. It saw a world without borders. It saw a world where people could freely travel between any country without being stopped and asked to unlock their phone, among other stronger things. These were, in a way, ironically utopian ideals, which it also condemned, but they're still progressive values and things that humanism was strongly committed to. By 2003, humanists learned to cut the word count down, and we got down to a single page, which I don't think rejects any of those values or ideals. It is in much broader language. It still talks about working to benefit society, maximizing individual happiness, minimizing inequities of circumstance, so fighting discrimination wherever it occurs, and a just distribution of nature's resources, so the fruits of human effort uh, can be enjoyed by as many as possible. It's still an atheist philosophy. It's still a philosophy that supports science and evidence and reason, but it's one that supports fighting injustice. And the same things are in the Amsterdam Declaration, and then we can go into that in the comments if you don't believe me, but in the effort, in the interest of not just reading to you, I want to talk about what humanists have done and what they are doing now. So the British Humanist Association is probably the most famous humanist association in the world. It's not the largest. The largest is the Norwegian Humanists, and I can talk about that briefly after I get into the others. Um, the British Human Association was effectively founded in 1896. It, came of, it was originally called the Union of Ethical Societies because in the late 19th century in Britain there was this movement called the Ethical Culture Society and Ethical Societies. And these were essentially religious atheists. These were people who wanted to get together, have a Christian-style ceremony almost, 
where there was no preaching dogma, where there was no orthodoxy, where the values were about human compassion and human reason. This dates back to the French Enlight this dates back to the French Revolution, and I've talked here before about the cult of the cult of reason, which was actually a thing. And then that got replaced by the cult of the supreme being because Robespierre believed in a deistic God and thought atheism would ruin everything. But there was a weird cult of reason at a time in France. And I could make a bad joke about the French, but I won't. So ethical societies existed in Britain in the 19th century, and they sought to develop ethical values and social reform. They were trying to make the world a better place through involving people. Interestingly, they were predominant, they were more women in these organizations than men. Maybe it just represents the times. Maybe it was just a way that women saw they could get together. Maybe the men didn't like the idea of a churchy atheism. I don't know. I wasn't around. But a bunch of these individual ethical societies joined together in 1896, formed the Union of Ethical Societies. There were 26 of them in 1905. By 1915, there were 70. Today, I think there are four or five. There's a couple in the States. There are still some around the UK, but they largely identify as humanists now because the values are the same. The British Humanist Association, which I'll just say now, even though it wasn't always named that, it supported repealing the blasphemy laws in the UK in 1912. It worked for secular education, developing moral education. It joined the Peace Society before the Great War, which really called for no conscription and opposed military training in school. Once again, it was a pacifist, or not even a, necessarily a pacifist, but opposed to war and sought peaceful means. It, it saw the threats Europe was facing in the early part of the 20th century and the late 19th century and said, no, we don't want to go this path. I like to think we were right. They held they continue to hold these sort of ethical worship, religious, humanist style ceremonies, but those stopped being popular around the 1950s. I don't know why again, but it was around that time they had to reevaluate what they were doing and they renamed themselves the British Humanist Association in 1967 after a few attempts to merge with some of the other similar like-minded groups like the Rationalist Association and the South Place, South Place Ethical Society, which they tried to merge with in the 50s and 60s. The South Place South Place Ethical Society built Conway Hall, which is essentially a church and meeting center for humanists in central London. And then when I lived in the UK, I would go there often for talks or Sunday assembly. And it was just nice to have a place where on the wall or on the stage or above the stage, it said, to thine own self be true. And there was just a feeling that no God has ever been in this place. Not that God ever existed, but this is our place. We don't have that in many cities. Ethical culture societies were actually good at building these places. There's one in New York as well. And like I said, James Croft, who I talked about earlier, he's now the leader of the Ethical Society in St. Louis, which is a humanist congregation, essentially. In the 1960s, the BHA campaigned to repeal the Sunday observance laws, which we had in Canada as well until 1988, where businesses couldn't open on Sundays because God. They sought to reform religion in schools, and they're still fighting that. They fought up, they stood up for freedom of speech and supported eliminating world poverty and just generally pushing back against religious privilege. Any place that religion sought to impose itself on other peoples, we pushed back. We're not trying to kill religion. We're not anti-religious, we're anti-privilege. Or we're, we're, against reduce, we're against inequality, so we push back against privilege. The BHA co-founded the Social Morality Council which argued for assisted dying, abortion, and an open society, the sort of multicultural one I talked about again. They also built things like the Humanist House Association to provide accommodation for needy elderly humanists. They created an agnostics, ag agnostics adoption society to fight for non-religious adoption rights because a lot of um, orphanages were discriminatory against the non-religious, as you can imagine, they were run by churches. They founded a humanist counseling group to pioneer non-directive counseling. So there's a long tradition of humanism in psychology, which is related but a separate thing. So when you search the history of humanism, the word gets used a lot of times. There's also a humanist mute movement in the arts, which is sort of related but independent. Today, the British Humanist Association has about 40,000 members. They have an annual operating budget of about half a million pounds, which is a lot. It's less now after Brexit. They're all very, most humanists are pretty sad about Brexit falling apart, as I talked about the 
idea of human rights. They saw it as a good defender and good bulwark. The BHA campaigns hard for LGBT equality. They fought hard for same-sex marriage bill that came through. And they also wanted to see that expanded to include um, humanist marriage, something we're fighting for as well here. They are pushing for equality in human rights, science and education, secularism. And they have a staff of about 10 people, most of whom are younger than me. I think their president, Andrew Copson's about 35, 36. And he's been, or sorry, their executive director, chief executive, and he's been chief exec for five or six years now, and has really sought to expand the organization and has done a lot for that. Great guy, very eloquent. This is Henry Morgenthaler, and so I want to talk a bit about humanism in Canada, and then I'll move into the American side. Sort of arbitrary which order I put them in. In Canada, Humanist Canada was founded in about the 1950s and 60s by thinkers and activists and the same kind of people who were involved in the British Humanist Association. The first groups were the Humanist Fellowship of Montreal and the Victoria Secular Humanist Association, who are still around today and still holding multiple meetings a week. The first board members of the Humanist Fellowship of Montreal were R.K. Mishra, Ernest Poser, Mary Ajada Khan, who some of you probably actually knew when they were around. Um, interestingly, on the early board of the Humanist Fellowship of Montreal, the walrus in one article says Pierre Elliott Trudeau was a member and a director. Trudeau was not a humanist when he died. He was a practicing Catholic by his own words in the most liberal sense of the word, just like his son is also a Catholic, and they both say they have a spiritual belief. Maybe, maybe. But there was a deep, there was a connection, and I don't know if there was a friendship between Henry Morgenthaler and Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but when Trudeau became prime minister, he's, when he moved to Ottawa to get involved in politics, he stepped down from the Humanist Fellowship of Montreal, and Henry Morgenthaler took over, expanded it greatly, and sort of brought together activists from across the country to make Humanist Canada, and that's where it comes from. And that was formed in 1968, Henry Morgenthaler being the first president. From there, Morgenthaler basically spent his entire life until the day he died fighting for reproductive freedoms, fighting for women to have access to abortions. Pierre Elliott Trudeau brought in the first Liberal, he was one of the first to liberalize abortion laws in Canada. He was one of the first to decriminalize homosexuality. Again, humanist values of standing up for freedom of choice and just getting out of the bedroom. But that wasn't far enough for Morgenthaler, being a humanist who said, no, we have to ensure everyone's choice is fully respected. So Morgenthaler went province by province, breaking the abortion law and either telling the jury, yes, I did it, but don't find me guilty because the law is unjust and the jury agreed. And so it was clear he did break the law, but the jury nullified the law, which is a very proud tradition. So humanism has a strong activist and kind of, I won't say humanists break the law just to change the law, but Henry Morgenthaler did. He eventually got put in jail for performing abortions and fought it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, where in 1988, I believe he was struck down under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which again is a pretty humanist document overall. Humanist Canada today has gone through a number of ebbs and flows over the last sort of couple decades as people get involved. It's very hard to run a national organization in this country. We're such a sparse and large country that getting people to be involved at a national level takes a lot of commitment. And so I applaud everyone who's been on the Humanist Canada board and tried to make it work. Um, it's primarily run by volunteers. They do have one admin assistant, and their budget is about thirty dollars to $40,000, which is actually comparable with our own right now. They also have the right to register celebrants in Ontario, and they do perform marriages for humanists in that province and the non-religious. But I want to talk about the American Humanist Association a bit more in depth because I think they're doing a lot of interesting things as well. They were founded in 1935, even though they wrote the manifesto in 1933. And they've been publishing a magazine the entire time. And through that magazine, we can see what 
the ideals and the ideals of humanism are, what the concerns are. In the 1950s, it was about science and human values, global human rights, and just the problems of traditional faith, things that would be familiar today. In the 60s and 70s with the civil rights area, <clears throat> excuse me, they began addressing justice and inequality. They sought to fight racism. They looked for ways to reduce poverty and support student unrest. They were against, or they were pro-communes, some humanists. They fought, or they talked out, they spoke out against war, they spoke for abortion and women's rights. And they talked a lot about those new cults of unreason, which started in the 60s and 70s and you can still see along the West Coast today. By the 1990s, they were really concerned with the drug war in the US because that was a cause of a lot of inequality and a lot of suffering. They supported, over, they supported reevaluating federal crime policies. A lot of employers were trying to do weird honesty tests and some things like that that they spoke out against. They also spoke out against government attempts to censor the internet and church state issues that involve, say, the Boy Scouts or religious influence on elections. They had writers talking about prostitution, about the global landmine problems, and even sweatshops, just really talking about inequality and how to stand up for the little guy or girl. By the 2000s and in the last sort of, it's now 17 years, they were critiquing wars. Remember the war in Iraq, which we didn't go to, thankfully. They talked about torture and government surveillance. They challenged the WTO. Again, they spoke out against the sweatshops and some of the writings in the New Humanist magazine won awards for their coverage of and exposés on sweatshops. They talked about global warming and electronic voting machines, they exposed government aid going to religion, debunked faith-based prison programs. They demystified Islam to try to just make sure Americans weren't making things up. They explored transhumanism, which is the idea that we can use technology to enhance humanity. And it's a related idea, but not entirely supported by all humanists. And they supported same-sex marriage. And today, they continue taking those on. They're campaigning for secularism, science, peace, reproductive freedoms, full women's rights and equality, LGBTQ rights, civil rights, and broader human rights. They renewed this commitment most strongly last year when the American Humanist Association launched and held what was called the Social Justice Conference, the Secular Social Justice Conference. And they launched three rebranded alliances. There had always been a feminist caucus, or I shouldn't say there had always been. Since about the 1970s, there had been a feminist caucus of the American Humanist Association. There had been an LGBTQ branch, and there had been black non-believers groups and black humanist groups, because each of these people, each of these groups has different issues with religion and how they need to fight inequality. And I think it's interesting to look at what these groups are doing. The LGBTQ Humanist Alliance, which is the American um, group, is much like the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Alliance of England and the British Humanists, sort of our own positions in pride. And they're about talking about standing up for LGBTQ rights, so pushing back against these bathroom bills that are being passed, standing up for same-sex marriage, um, and just really looking to stand up for marginalized groups that are committing suicide at higher rates, that are persecuted by religious. They fought back against gay conversion therapies, which are sometimes state-funded. The Feminist Humanist Alliance is part of a sort of long historic connection of humanist groups around the world supporting the feminist movement, the idea that men and women are equal, that's all it means. Here's an International Humanist Ethical Union, which on World, International World Humanist Day a few days ago said, this is the symbol of, the, the symbol of humanism is a happy human. That was actually made in 1953, I believe, and agreed by the world. It doesn't have a gender. It's definitely a feminist, though. Here's the British Humanist Association, whose current president has spoken up against gendered toys. And here's the American Humanist Association, also celebrating International Women's Day. I'm not trying to debate feminism here. I'm just trying to show that humanist groups are connected to the feminist movement. And that doesn't mean everyone in this room has to agree. We're a very diverse intellectual group. But this is where the biggest groups in the world are. And finally, the Black Humanist Alliance is potentially the one that's challenging people the most in the US. Humanism has been very white for a long time. Most of the biggest humanist groups are in 
Caucasian Western countries and have focused a lot on science and these issues that are primarily of interest to us. But church state issues affect black people in the states a lot. The civil rights era was led by church leaders who were on the progressive side, but not all black churches are as progressive. So fighting for racial justice is a humanist issue. And so creating these alliances is not about factionalizing humanism. It's about going to where people are and helping them fight the issues that affect them directly. So the Black Humanist Alliance has been very strongly supporting the goals and the ideal aims of the Black Lives Matter movement. So to speak up against police brutality, to speak up against racist positions in the US, it's really looking to end racial injustice. And if you go to these three websites of these three alliances, they each connect to each other. They each, they each highlight how important it is not to go off into our little corners like the Humanist Manifesto says, but to celebrate who we are, but also recognize the importance of helping each other. So the black humanists talk about the importance of supporting feminist rights. They talk about the, support, the importance of supporting LGBTQ rights because black gay people face different issues than white gay people. And it's not about factualizing again. It's about being intersectional even. So this is, sincere, this is Sincere Carabo. He was hired last year by the American Humanist Association as their social justice coordinator. And he's spoken about it as saying, in talking about humanism, he says separation of church and state is important, but so is addressing social, economic, and political deprivations that directly affect atheists within LGBTQIA, racial, and gender minority communities. A heightened sense of responsibility among those associated with the movement, with movement atheism, which is broader, is reflected in the organized efforts that is secular social justice. So he said that in reference to the conference they held last year. He's highlighting atheism isn't enough. So how does that play out in Vancouver and in Canada today? There's a lot of issues of inequality. There's economic inequality. There's First Nations inequality, as highlighted by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The current government has promised to enact the 94 recommendations, and that's a good step, but we need to see those done. And we also need to recognize the harm religion has done to First Nations communities and support equality. There's this piece in Daily Extra recently highlighting that Vancouver police might be the most progressive in North America, but they're still not perfect, and we still need to hold them to account because they have power. If you don't believe this headline, remember that Robert Picton kept killing women for years until the police finally started listening. So I'm not trying to argue whether we should take BLM or Pride Vancouver's side on the issue of the Vancouver police. I see that as largely sort of between them, but I think if we're silent on these issues, we're failing our values. Sexual assault is still a real issue. This cover story in the Globe and Mail has become their campaign of the year. This is a massive article, which I encourage you all to read. It's called Unfounded, and it's about how when women go to the police in Canada, one in five of them aren't believed. And this isn't that their issues, it isn't that their case is being rejected. This is just that in some cases, police go, yeah, I don't care. We've heard in the last couple weeks about two judges in Canada, one in Nova Scotia, who said being, you can still consent when you're drunk and he dismissed a sexual assault case when a woman was passed out drunk in a cab. We heard about an Alberta judge who was just fired who said, well, clearly she consented because she could have just snapped her legs shut. Exactly. The wage gap still exists, all of these issues. Here's racism in Vancouver according to the people who are likely to experience it. And trans rights bills are finally being brought in on equal par with defense of sex, gender, age, and all the other grounds. This is something we have supported as an organization when we signed the Trans Equality Now Pledge, which we've been required to sign to participate in the Pride March. BC has brought in trans rights finally in the last year, and finally the federal government is doing the same, despite some opposition from religious corners. 
And here's Byron Wood, one of the people we are supporting, who is pushing back against religion in AA programs. He highlights how our system is really designed to sort of privilege religion, both from the courts and employers who say, all right, you're an addict you, or you have an addiction, you need to go to this treatment program. And there's only one choice, and it's religious. This connects to some of the people I've met who are in prison who are atheists and want similar support. Again, all of these are people being stepped on who we can stand behind. All right, I want to talk about a different story myself now. I want to talk about how I didn't necessarily have to be the person I am today. I didn't have to be humanist, but I could still be an atheist. I grew up in southern Alberta, like I said. I was a nerdy kid. I liked playing on the internet. I, act, I said I liked punk rock, but before I liked punk rock, I actually liked country music. In grade nine, I wrote an essay for social studies about who would you vote for, and I said I'd vote for the Reform Party because the West needs a voice. You can call these the naive things about a child, but it's the sort of culture of small towns, and but for a few chances, perhaps I would have gone to the U of C instead and stayed at home and would have kept the same sort of circle of friends. And I would have developed very differently. I could have, I spent a lot of time online. I was a nerdy kid. I didn't have many girlfriends in school. One of the things online, and this is the embarrassing, like m this is mostly true, I'm not lying, but the alternate path I think is important. A lot of the things that are happening on the internet today are radicalizing young white men. I could have easily fallen down that path, perhaps if I didn't have a disabled brother, if I went to Calgary instead of Edmonton, if I didn't live by myself and have to challenge the sort of culture I grew up in. I could have spent time on internet forums trying to figure out how to pick up women, which I know people have done. And that's a sort of start to falling down a rabbit hole because from there you start to read partial statistics where you hear something, oh, 50% of women are domestic, or 50% of domestic assault victims are men. And that's one stat that, out of context, you can start to build a case that, oh, you know what, equality has been achieved for women, but what about the men? And then I could have also started to talk about, well, what about white people? It seems like all we're talking about is black people and First Nations. Aren't they just lazy and corrupt? Like, look at how much corruption there is on First Nation bands never minding that we aren't funding their schools as much as we fund schools in the city of Vancouver, never minding the residential school issue that we haven't addressed, never minding children's scoops that exist until the 60s. I could have easily gone down this path, becoming more and more anti-feminist, essentially. I'd still be an atheist. I could talk about reason and how I was a hyper-rationalist, and you see this online. There is a segment of the atheist community online, especially on YouTube, where they don't promote humanist values. They talk in hyper-rational terms and reject equality. And so today, in this alternate universe, I might be reading every Rebel Media article, adopting it as my core position, and getting upset that there's a motion before Parliament that condemns Islamophobia when a motion doesn't do anything. There was politics between the Liberals and Conservatives, and we can debate the word Islamophobia, but when they're talking about ending systemic racism and just condemning it. It's either it doesn't matter or we should support it. If I'd gone to the most extreme end, as I said, I went into engineering, I could have ended up like Mark Lapine, who was an atheist, and we need to own that. That the man who walked into a cold polytechnique on December 6, 1989, and shot 14 women was a committed atheist, was an anti-feminist. I'm not saying, obviously, all atheists or all anti-feminists go this way, hashtag not all anti-feminists. But we need to stand up for the marginalized groups and we need to recognize that humanism is more than being an atheist, it's more than being rational, it's about caring about injustice, it's about fighting for equality. And it's not to say that if those aren't your issues that you have to leave this room, you're of course welcome here. We except everyone, but I also don't think we need to keep being tolerant of intolerance. We can speak up against racism and bigotry and not be afraid of being called out for it, and not being afraid of generating an outrage machine that calls you anti-PC. If you say a racist thing and I call you racist, or I say that's racist, that's all. That's just a dialogue and free speech. I want to close off, though, by reading from the end of the humanist, 
the second Humanist Manifesto because it's got a fantastic just summary. And you'll forgive me if this is a little bit long, but it's beautiful wording. The world cannot wait for a reconciliation of competing political or economic systems to solve its problems. These are times for men and women of goodwill to further the building of a peaceful and prosperous world. We urge the hierarchical loyalties and inflexible moral and religious ideologies to be transcended. We urge recognition of the common humanity of all people. We further urge the use of reason and compassion to produce the kind of world we want, a world in which peace, prosperity, freedom, and happiness are widely shared. Let us not abandon that vision in despair or cowardice. We are responsible for what we are or will be. Let us work together for a humane world by means commensurate with human ends, humane ends. Destructive ideological differences among communism, capitalism, socialism, conservatism, liberalism, and radicalism should be overcome. Let us call for an end to terror and hatred. We will survive and prosper only in a world of shared humane values. We can initiate new directions for humankind. Ancient rivalries can be superseded by broad-based cooperative efforts. The commitment to tolerance, to understanding, and peaceful negotiation does not, ne does not necessitate acquiescence to the status quo nor the damming up of dynamic and revolutionary forces. The true revolution is occurring and can continue in countless nonviolent adjustments, but this entails the willingness to step forward onto new and expanding plateaus. At the present juncture of history, commitment to all humankind is the highest commitment of which we are capable. It transcends the narrow allegiances of church, state, party, class, or race in moving toward a vision of human potentiality. What more daring a goal for humankind than for each person to become, in ideals as well as practice, a citizen of a world community? It is a classical vision. Now we can give it a new vitality. Humanism thus interpreted is a moral force that has time on its side. We believe humankind has the potential, intelligence, goodwill, and cooperative skill to implement this commitment in the decades ahead. Thank you. <laughs>